That's probably us. Yeah. Testing. All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, this is the test taker's guide to the OpenStack administration exam. Um, real quick, anyone here take the exam yet? Okay. <laughs> well, hey, they could have taken it and looking to get tips on retaking it. Um, so what we're going to do as far as an overview is we're going to do a quick introductions um, and then we're going to get into uh, the overview. What is the exam? And then we're going to try and move that as quickly as possible so we can really get to questions and open it up to you guys and, and start um, really answering some of the questions you guys might have and help you uh, pass the exam. So hi, my name is Seth Fox. I'm the VP of Delivery for Selenia. We're an OpenStack consulting and service provider. I'm Jeff Olson, um, Offer Development Lead for OpenStack at EMC Global Services. And I'm Ron Terry. I'm a training architect for SUSE, responsible for developing all of the SUSE training around uh, OpenStack and SUSE Linux and all of our other products. Hi, my name is Susan Wu. I'm the director of technical marketing for Mitokura. Shameless plug, MitoNet is the fourth most popular Neutron plugin for 1,000 cores and above. All right, this is Susan. So Susan, okay. you're here to hear about level set the, on, on the definition. Yeah, what is an OpenStack administrator? So this is a definition that a committee of folks of peers sort of developed this. So you should have at least six months of OpenStack experience. Anybody out there? Okay, uh, kind of real hands-on type experience, not just textbook. Um, you should have uh, knowledge of kind of the core projects like compute, storage, networking, and you know, general data center experience. And when they t test you, you should be able to demonstrate the competence either using the CLI or the UI or the a primarily CLI and, a P uh, and UI, um, a little bit lesser on the API side. And then there's uh, the only caveat is there's really no expectation for you to kind of install that product or kind of architect a solution for somebody. Um, that's kind of not in the scope of the exam. It's really a running open SAC environment. So just a little bit on how we actually went about creating this exam. So we, there was a, an original committee, the JTAC committee, we went through and came, uh, come up with the tasks that had to be solved for this exam. This was uh, SMEs from around the community, around the world. You can see the list of the people that participated. We had people from India to the US, uh, through all of Europe. So there's a, a wide range of people that were participating in this. Um, two thirds of the group had you know, direct experience and, two thir and the other third had hire made hiring decisions. So we tried to get a diverse group of people together that would actually know what they were looking for in an administrator as well as how to be an administrator. So like I said, it was a, a wide range across the world. Um, and what we were doing was de developing what knowledge was gonna be needed to, to pass this exam, which areas, and we'll drive into a little bit about that as we go further, but how much is compute, how much is storage, and so on, and, and you can sort of see where that, where that breakdown lies as you, as you prepare for the exam. So once the job task analysis, or JTAC, committee finished kind of outlining the objectives that the exam was going to cover, another committee was put together, the item writing committee, and it was our job all of us participated on the item writing committee, only a few of us participated in the JTAC. But it's our job as the item writing community to come up with the actual exam items or questions that you'll have to uh, answer or uh, fulfill as you're taking the examination. So we took the objectives that were delivered to us by the JTAC and then turned those into actual questions, actual scenarios that you need to, uh, to, to perform. So here's really the question why you're all here, right? Yeah, that's why you're here. How do I prepare to pass the exam? Well, guess what? It's a simple answer. Get hands-on experience. This is a practicum exam. That's important to understand. You're actually put down in front of, you'll have horizon and you'll have a command line. And you're going to be asked to perform tasks. This is hands-on. It's competency-based. So you want to prepare? You got to practice. So the next question is, well, how do I get hands-on experience? Well, as was maybe outlined before, the idea of the, this exam, this admin level, is, is the expectation of about six months practical experience using OpenStack. 
So if you have six months of experience of actual day-to-day -day usage or the equivalent, you're probably at a good start. But that, not everybody is going to have experience. Oftentimes people are going to get certifications so that they can get a job. So you kind of get that chicken and the egg. Well, I need to get experience so I can get the job, so I can get some experience to get the job, right? So there are other ways you can get experience, get hands-on experience. One of these ways is to find some kind of certification training. Uh, we at SUSE provide certification training specifically around the Certified OpenStack exam. We jumped on board and said, look, this is the right way to go. So our certification includes the actual certification exam and it's all practicum based. So that's an example for our company as I think some of my uh, compatriots here have a similar type of training. But training isn't going to get you all the way there. Training is a good start. Go get some training, kind of be guided through the beginning, but then practice, practice, practice. Use the, you know, the material that maybe was provided by the, 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 the training course. Go look at the objectives for the exam. They're actually published. We have a link to that here in the slides. But practice, practice. And once you can run through all of the exam uh, objectives without having to con continue to look at notes to help you through, then you're probably going to be ready to attempt the exam. The nice thing about the exam, though, is you do get a, a, a free retake. So if you go the first time and you just don't do as well, you don't pass, you can get, you can schedule to take it again uh, without having to pay for that second time. If you bomb it that second time, well, you're gonna have to pony up some more money. And one last thing to add, uh, you can practice on pretty much any mainstream distribution. So anything that's not heavily modified, the APIs or, the, or anything that doesn't seamlessly plug in through the, through the command line clients uh, will be absolutely sufficient. Yeah, exactly. All right, so let's just get to the requirements. Um, you know, really, as mentioned before, this exam was created to, to really be, um, you know, offer that career path-based training uh, to help you uh, get the right skills or, or let your employer know or let whoever know that you have the right skill sets to drive an OpenStack environment, not necessarily stand it up like was taught, uh, discussed before, but really take the keys and drive that environment. Um, you know, it's really geared to those people that have six months experience uh, within the field. That's, that's pretty much our recommendation. Um, you know, if you're looking to get an official list or, or more information about the requirements, uh, you can visit the openstack.org slash COA slash requirements. Uh, we'll go some of those requirements now and how we broke those down into different domains. Uh, domains are, there's about 10 different domains, uh, which really kind of gets into what are the actual tasks and objectives uh, related to each of those um, domains. So, so really the, the first one we get into is getting to know OpenStack, right? So really this area is it's 3% of the test, so you're talking about a couple questions, um, but you need to understand, right, right, what are the components that make up an OpenStack environment, and really how do you leverage the API and, and or the command line interface to interact with those APIs. Um, next one is identity management. This is a bigger chunk of the exam, 12%. Um, really have to understand uh, how to manage the keystone catalog services and the endpoints. Um, be able to manage and create project users, roles, tenants, um, and, and, and really manage that, those users of that environment. Um, and also verify that it's operational, right? So, so along with not only creating uh, users and domains and whatnot, making sure that you can troubleshoot any sort of issues that go on with it. Right, so the, the next domain uh, we'll talk about is the dashboard. Right? One of the things you'll see is the percentage is going up and down. This is what one of the things we did as we went through the process trying to figure out, you know, sort of where to focus the exam. And, and the idea here, because it's an administrator exam, just verify the operation of the dashboard. You have to be able to use the dashboard to pass the exam. But in terms of the administration functions, it's really just about verifying dashboard operation. Um, compute, obviously a larger percentage. This is one of the, one of the key functions. And it, it focuses across a, a much wider range. You're going through flavors, uh, managing key pairs, um, launching and starting, launching, uh, you know, in, instance life cycles, uh, terminate, shut down, you know, restart, basically going through floating IP addresses. There's some specific stuff about networking, which we'll talk about as well. But it's much more, uh, much wider range of functions you're going to use here because it's really much, much more used within the OpenStack environment. Right? And again, you'll see things like verify operation of services. That's across all these. As an administrator role, that's where that focus is going to be. 
Okay, so for storage, and there's both object and um, uh, block. So for storage, actually, a lot of these questions are not vendor specific, so more skills and task oriented. So, you know, things like uh, managing access to the object store, you know, storage policies, you know, monitoring the space, or verifying different operations, um, or even permissions or quotas. These are uh, going into the domain of the object storage. And uh, you'll notice that these things have weights. So it's actually um, according to the amount of tasks that are required or that are associated with the administrator. Uh, next one. Uh, so block storage got a lot of stuff, but it's again only 10%. Um, you know, very common tasks that storage administrators handle and, and OpenSec administrators handle. You know, managing the volumes, um, you know, creating new storage volumes, uh, quotas as I mentioned before. Uh, it's something like snapshotting, that is a common, sure there's a question about snapshotting. Um, you know, managing, uh, you know, setting up storage pool, a very common task. Monitoring, checking reserve capacity, you know, analyzing storage and, and, and performance and that kind of stuff. That's all in this domain. Awesome. Networking, one of the domains that I get lots of questions, uh, a lot of people are interested in. So this is Neutron, which you're going to be covering here. So it's all sorts of uh, network management, also creating and managing networks, subnets, routers, uh, floating IP addresses, uh, <clears throat> what are that? It, uh, firewall rules, uh, security groups, those types of things. Um, troubleshooting, again, is part of this. Being able to uh, you know, ha have you do something and they say, hey, there's a problem here. Identify what this problem is. Why can't these instances talk to each other? Or why is you know, this, this IP address not working the way you'd expect it to? So again, it is taking you just a step beyond just having to do, do uh, steps. You need to kind of go, all right, did this actually work? Is it uh, solving the problem? Okay, heat orchestration. This also means, okay. Uh, this is, again, all about being able to launch application stacks. So do you understand what a heat stack is? Can you uh, get information about a heat stack that has is currently been launched, is currently running? and report back information from that. Can you launch a heat stack? Can you build uh, a, a heat template, a simple heat template, and be able to launch a, a stack? And then again, verify that this stuff is actually running. And I think also d verify that you understand difference between parameters and resources and outputs and, and all the hooks yeah, exactly. and stuff like that. So it's not just, hey, how can you launch a, a heat, heat stack? It's actually show how you can actually understand what the different sections of a template means. Exactly. Troubleshooting, this is a big one. Um, I think really, big, I'm not gonna go into all of it, but I understand where your logs are. Um, I think that's one of the biggest yes. misconceptions a lot of people who are running an open stack environment is they don't really check the logs too much or they're relying on a MNR component of, of pulling those logs in. So as far as this exam is concerned, know where your logs are, log your, where your logs are stored um, and know how to get there. Yeah, and especially being able to recognize messages, important messages in those log files. You know, which service corresponds to which log file and the type of messages you're going to find in those log files. And then image management, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, again, you know, really, you know, how can you create an image? How can you upload it into the image repository? Um, and how can you leverage those images to create new instances or create snapshots or um, build from an image, so on and so forth. So another, another good chunk of the exam. So make sure uh, you, know, you definitely learn how to work with images, whatever your practice environment is. Uh, so this is nitty gritty, like how does this exam work? And you should save some questions for Ron Terry. He actually took the exam yesterday. But anyway, so in a nutshell, it's um, delivered remotely online. You're, you have access to um, like a Chromebox machine and it's proctored you know, online with, with somebody. So this week you're taking the exams here, but after this week uh, you can take that anywhere online. Um, the content is based on the Liberty release. Um, but there will be revisions. Um, they'll, they'll look to revise this um, every uh, two years. Uh, the cost of the exam is $300. Um, if you fail, you can retake at no charge. And uh, I think the foundation announced a lot of partners that are already reselling this exam, so you can go there. Um, again, I mentioned the revision time is every two, two years to freshen up the content. 
But the certification itself, which is individual for the person, that's valid for three years. So for example, you could stick that in your resume and show it to an employer. Um, machine gradable is a concept that I, I just got exposed to this. <laughs> so in the creation of the exam, you know, there, there's no examiner watching you to make sure you're not cheating, right? So everything that you work on, you would be given a, a directory for you to f uh, copy and paste uh, your answers, and that could be uh, graded by a machine so that if you demonstrate the competency on how something is done, it is kind of documented in all your steps. Can you jump in real quick? Yeah. And part of this machine gradability is also not so much how you did it as the end result. And that, that's the, the point that they're really checking is you can machine grade, did the end, is the end result correct? I don't care how you got there. Yep, yep. so uh, just to add a little bit on that, so you could do that, perform that with either CLI or on the Horizon UI. So this uh, exam is based on an Ansible, on a kind of like a vanilla Ubuntu. OpenStack Ansible. So if you guys yeah. are familiar with that, OpenStack Ansible or OpenStack Ansible deployment is what is formally called, but yeah. Yeah, so another point from the foundation is um, while we were creating the exam, exam, we had to kind of pilot out to figure out you know, whether the questions are valid, but we, we, we couldn't figure out what constitute passing. So this week they're gonna pilot it and put a bunch of you out there to test and then figure out what might be constitute as passing. And then if some questions are, are um, kind of like maybe a lot of exam people fail or something, they, they may consider you know, um, move, changing out the questions. But um, they are still determining you know, what, what is considered passing, so. All right, so we'll get into some sample questions. Um, first one is Ron, um, sample question around compute. Yeah, so if you want to kind of ex an example of the type of questions you're going to be asked when you get into the exam, we've got three examples here from three of the different areas. Uh, first of this is compute. So the example here is have you authenticate to OpenStack as a user, and you'll, you'll be given a username and, and password that's, that will be associated with that. And then you'll change into a context of a, a, a specific um, project, and then once you're in the context of that project, they'll have you, you know, maybe launch an instance from a specific flavor, using a specific image, uh, injecting a, you know, a specific uh, SSH key, uh, connecting to a specific network. So again, just the types of things that you're going to, uh, would, would normally be doing, but these will be randomized in that it may be the same general question for everybody but the specifics are going to be different for every person who takes it. So you get a, a nice randomization across uh, the, all the test takers, uh, but it, you're still being tested on the same set of skills. Networking. Okay, this is my favorite question, because <laughs> I kind of wrote part of it. But anyway, so uh, troubleshooting a floating IP, this is like things that you do almost every day. Um, so again, log into a specific instance, they'll give you the name, whatever it is, it'll flash up, and then you'll use uh, that instance to ping another instance. And then, you know, maybe the ping would not work, right? Because you're, you know, the damn floating IP, you, you can't ping to it. So you'll have to figure out what network settings are, are, um, need to be changed. So you'll have to dig through the logs. You would need to dig through both the neutron logs and the Nova logs. Trust me, you do. <laughs> and then you'll have to demonstrate that, that you, you, you know where the logs are and you demonstrate what the problem is. And then you, you know, provide the settings and then make the changes to show that you can um, ping the uh, floating IP. And then for, for storage, you know, one of the pretty seems straightforward, but create and delete a block storage volume. So really this type of question is, you know, you want to be able to create that volume. Um, you want to create that using the Cirrus image uh, within the repository, and you want to create a size of that, uh, that volume of six gigs. And then what you want to do is then uh, basically you want to pull up, well, what, what instances are currently running the environment that I can attach this to? So you want to find web node one. Uh, attach that volume to web node one. Um, and once everything is attached, you confirm that it's operational um, to show that you can actually not only create, attach, um, but also you want to delete uh, for web node one and not just detach it, but also delete it from being listed as an avail available volume. So you see, it could get a little bit tricky if you uh, detach and don't delete. Uh, it's one of the little snags you might get um, hung up on and marked wrong if you don't, if you don't do that. Uh, it didn't, that's a, he po uh, pointed out a good thing. Make sure you read through the entire yeah. scenario because they're going to have you do some things that you might not be expecting and it may be buried in the middle of a paragraph or towards the end and you just zipped over it. Make sure you 
read the question and understand everything that they want you to do. Right. Again, speaking from experience, because I just took the test yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're to the Q&A. We've already got a hand. Go ahead, there to the microphone. The microphone yeah. Do we have the mics on yet? The house mics? Doesn't matter. So go back to the previous slide, right? And uh, so your wording there, a little uh, tricky, um, delete my volume so it's no longer attached. Well, presumably, if I delete the volume, it's no longer attached. So, um, all right, so you're specifically saying so detach the volume detach, and then delete correct. the volume, right? Yeah. So, so maybe some bad wording here. Yeah. Uh, I would say that, yeah, okay, thanks. <laughs> but again, so these, well, let's just make this, yeah. hold on, let's just back up for a second. These aren't actual yeah. exam questions. All right, They're, so for instance, like, these are kay. examples. We've got another question over on this side. We'll kind of go back and forth here unless people all line up against one. Go ahead. Okay, I, I, I did the, the exam as a beta tester uh, last week, actually, and uh, I'm wondering who is determining the, the points for a question, because, for example, taking an example for this, uh, the object store, uh, the number of questions I had is practically representing the, the ten percentage of what is in the in the requirement section, but but the points uh, was rather twenty. So it's uh, in general I, I found that that sometimes it's 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 um, it's unbalanced. I mean I, I have a, a, a quite a complicated question for three points, and I have a very simple like starting up and par, uh, a heat stack with a current set of parameters for five. So uh, maybe it has to be a little bit revised. So uh, let me hear then, Susan's got it. So my observation on this, uh, at least, again, I don't know the exact answer, and she might know better about this, but a lot of times it's based on the number of tasks you have to complete to do the actual item. So they might be easy tasks, but you may have to demonstrate you know, three or four items of knowledge or skill to be able to get the answer. So that could contribute to the number of points you get based on the number of things you're being tested within that, that, ex that, that question. I'll add a tiny bit to it. Seth and I were in the job task group. So we looked at a battery of job tasks. And clearly there's a lot of work when you're an open stack administrator. But um, a lot of the tasks um, we took out um, and did not write questions for them because they were um, something that you do and it's kind of rudimentary. Then after all the most important tasks, that is turned over to the item writing committee to write questions that could be tested. And then within these questions, uh, you can see different segments. So each segment, you can score points. So for example, there's three here, right? So you could have done maybe segment one and got points, and then segment two, you could have missed. And then you, you might not earn, so meaning you get partial credit. And then each of these questions have level of difficulty. So depending on, you know, if this question might be, and I remember the levels of difficulty was one, two, or three, or something like that. Can't remember. But anyway, so depending on level of difficulty and the completion, so certain things would appear that, um, uh, that you could have scored higher points on, on even and easier questions, so to speak, and then you could have partially completed a very difficult question, and then in that case, you might have even scored more points on the difficult question because you earn more partial credits. So, I mean, uh, you know, it's all pretty tough to okay, determine so, right so, now. So did that answer your question? So could you have, let's say, half completed question? Yes, you can have partial completed questions and you would get the points for successful completing the tasks yeah. within that. You may not, as if there was like five tasks and you completed three correctly, you could get three of the five points. Okay, so I'll give you an example of that. Uh, there was a question with five points to say, okay, create an RC file. Right. With username, project name, <laughs> tenant name. So can you okay, type so those five things in? Five, right? <laughs> so I can miss, let's say, one of them and I have four points, right? Right. Is it the case? Well, yeah, so <laughs> she also called something out that's important. There's the concept of points and there's a concept of weight. And you can go through and they first evaluate, here's the number of points that they got. Then they do a second pass that then reweights those points based on the difficulty of, uh, of, the, of the questions. And so, you know, I may start with 90 out of, well, let's say 70 out of 100 points. And then after they go through the weighting, you did really well on hard ones. That could actually jump your score up to like 80 or 90 because the points aren't always equal in, in value once you go that, that second round based on the weighting and based on difficulty. But, but that, that is practically an important fact, because you, ha you may have to advertise that. 
because so, may, people might have an impression that, okay, I skip this question because this is a one point one, and I, I jump on a, another one because it is a five point one. So we, yeah, we have well, a bunch of people. I think we just advertised that because this is being recorded, right? So, so, so we, have, we have a bunch of people. But yes, we have a bunch of people with questions we have yeah, to get so to. So, so if you want to come up and, and yeah. talk afterwards, yeah, we can yeah. go off. We can after. Let's go back over over here. Over here. Yeah, I have a couple. Um, one would be, how long do you get if you need to retake the test to do so? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, if you have a certain time period between when you first take it and w when you have to take the second one, I don't know the answer to that. Do you guys? If you bring up your card, we can. If you bring up your card, we'll send you a note and we'll find out for you. Okay. And then, how long does it take to find out if you passed or not? Do we know that? Uh, three days is what they're telling right now. Whether that's going to decrease in time uh, in the future, right now, I don't know. But right now, it's you'll you'll find out three days after. Okay. And then, are do you kind of have the option of how you do every question on the exam? Whether you use Horizon or the command line, or are you instructed? Yes. Okay. In most every case. Well, in many cases, you can perform the task either in Horizon or the command line. There are some questions, however, that you can only complete from the command line. So you do need to have command line experience uh, for those specific things. And you're free to use the help of the command line as you would normally? Uh, yes. And as a matter of fact, uh, you're also allowed to open up a tab and go to docs.opensusa.org. So those docs are also available during mean, the exam. You mean OpenStack? Open I mean, stack. what did I say? Open Open. Oh, I'm a SUSE guy. I'm sorry. <laughs> docs.openstack.org. <laughs> yeah, shameless plug, unintentional. Um, but I'll tell you, if you have to get into the docs, you're going to run out of time. So you got to know what you're looking for and not just be trying to, to comb through. Okay, thank you. Okay, he, we have an answer here of one year from right. when we purchased the exam is, is the retake right. time frame. Thank you. Thanks. Over here. Uh, just a quick question because uh, we've been talking about cheating. Um, whenever, you, uh, whenever you see a test, there are different approaches to what material you might use to pass the test. So I guess in, uh, for the OpenStack exam, you might not use documentation and manuals, but really only what's in your mind, right? Or are we allowed to use okay. help pages, man pages? Talks. So here's what it's available. You have the command line and you have man pages and you have the help that's associated with the API command line commands. You're okay. also allowed to open up a tab because this is all done in a web browser. Right? So I have one tab that is kind of here's what the test is. You go to the next tab and that is, is where you have uh, a window that's a command prompt and another tab is the horizon. You're okay. allowed to open up another tab that goes to docs.openstack.org and you can use anything on that page. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you. Oh. One, one more thing to add to that, if the, even, you know, you're taking, if you're taking the exam here, there's a proctor in the room with you, but when you're taking the exam remotely, it's, you'll need a webcam enabled machine and they'll actually be remote proctoring for that, so. Sure, thanks. Okay. Um, I wanted to kind of get some more clarification on the guy's previous question here. Uh, you've kind of been saying we have the option of using Horizon or the CLI generically. Does the CLI mean the specific component uh, plugin, like the glance client or Cinder client, or does it mean uh, the, like it, the, the OpenStack it's client the outcome. or either? It's the outcome. So you can use the OpenStack client. You can install the Nova client. You can whatever well, the outcome. Uh, to be specific, me. OpenStack client, Nova client, I mean, all of the, the CLI clients are installed. Right. Okay. So if you know how to do it using Nova, and, or you know how to use the, do the task using OpenStack, it doesn't matter. You can use any of the command line clients. It doesn't have to be just one of them. Okay. Whatever so, gives you that outcome of yes or, yeah. no, or correct answer or not. Okay. So we have a, a large number of interfaces. We have Horizon, uh, probably a couple of different client interfaces, and I'm guessing even like the, the REST calls if you wanted to get that deep. If you wanted to do REST calls, you probably could, but that's, uh, you might as well, uh, whatever, whatever <laughs> floats your boat. <laughs> All right. Cool. Thanks. Um, I have a question about the sort of deliberate limitation of available resources that the examinee can take, uh, including having a person watching over you. If someone is running into a troubleshooting situation in OpenStack and they're not using all available resources they can find for that, that would make them a horrible OpenStack operator that I would not want to hire. So my question is, what exactly was the reasoning behind deliberately limiting the number of resources or the amount of resources available for taking the test? I think I can answer this one. Um, writing an exam and maintaining the integrity of an exam 
is actually quite difficult because, and I have to say, I'm right there with you, that in a real world, knowing how to find the right the answer is almost more important than knowing the right answer right. off the bat. And so having to limit the availability of, of resources is really there because honestly, it won't take long for somebody to write a cheat sheet, post it, available to Google, it says question one, type this, question two, type this. That's really the reason is we have to limit the potential of those types of things, yet still allow enough documentation that people could search and find the answer. It's not a perfect world, but it's probably the best that we're going to get for a while, unfortunately. That work? Okay. Over here, I guess. Right here. Uh, good afternoon. Two quick questions. Uh, Mr. Terry, I believe you're um, conducting the course for the next two days. Um, Wednesday, yes, we, uh, SUSE is offering the uh, Certified Open Science Administrative Preparation course for the next two days, yes. Okay. Um, is there anything I need to do to prep the laptop for the uh, course? No, nope. uh, we're going to give you everything you need as you, when you come in. Everything you need is there. Okay. And second part, is there a possibility of having a Friday exam session? Seems counterintuitive not to have it after the course. Yeah, so I talked to uh, the administrators of the exam about that question and they brought this up specifically. They would have loved to offer the test on Friday. They just don't have the rooms. They have to be out of the rooms uh, on Thursday. It was really about having a room availability. But, that, but remember, you can take this test at home Okay. So it's just here at the, at the uh, summit that you actually go to a room and sit down in front of a computer that's monitored by somebody in person. Every time after this is going to be you sitting at home with a webcam on your computer and having somebody remotely proctor you. Okay. I didn't know if there was a time machine involved. Uh, but but I mean, let, me, <laughs> let me just be, warn you as well. The expectation of going to a two-day class to learn everything you need to be able to pass the test on the next day is stretching it. Yeah. You really need to practice. I mean, if you come in with a lot of experience and you're using that as kind of a, just a refresher, then you might have a chance to pass it. But don't come in and expect to pass the, on the third day. Uh, and from my perspective, having that mulligan available to you, what perfect way to prepare for the exam is while it's fresh in your head and go from there. Yeah. Let, let me add one point. So the troubleshooting questions were not written for test uh, taking, you know, kind of, or exam or uh, training environments. They require you to have some knowledge of production open stack environments. Because there, I mean, there's almost no way you would need to troubleshoot if you only have like two or three machines. So, so you, you do need the hands-on experience. Just, and one more thing to add to that, and you know, Selenia is awful, also preparing exams, or excuse me, classes to help people prepare for it, but it, it really is, because it's a practicum, practicum exam, you really, it's expecting you to know how to do things, not just, you know, the classes that we develop have hands-on components, but you're not going to get in two days enough hands-on experience to, to pass an exam like this. In the first uh, to extend on that, is there a lab available to where we can kind of beat on a test environment? So that really kind of depends. I can speak from my, uh, Susan, we're going to provide you something you can take home and practice. There are plenty of other people, gentleman down here raising oh. his hand. I'm going to give him props. I'm not going to call out your name though, dude. Sorry. <laughs> uh, there are plenty of people who can provide that. Let me just, I, I want to share an experience that I had. Uh, when I, after taking the test yesterday, I was sitting and talking to uh, the man who's responsible for kind of generating and maintaining the test. And we had a gentleman come up to us and said, oh my gosh, nobody told me this was going to be hands-on. I went and took a training course for, from this company and, and none of it was hands-on. And I was expecting a, a question and answer and I failed. I want to be perfectly clear that if you're going to go try to get training from some third party, make sure that it's hands-on, it's practicum based. Because if you're just going to go get some uh, training that doesn't give you hands-on experience, you're not really preparing for the exam. And, it, you get, and there are plenty of people who are going to provide that type of training, but just make sure that they're providing hands-on experience. Are you going to be offering this training at future conferences? Or is this a one-time deal? Are you talking about SUSE? Yep. Yes, we're planning on offering this into the future. Yeah, was, was there a limit of how many times you could take the test? If you, I mean, if you fail it, you said you get one retake, but... Well, you get one retake that, that's paid for as part of that, but I don't know if there's a limitation of how many times you can try. Do you know? Yeah, so I, I did ask the foundation. There's no limit. You can go again, you know, whenever you want. Pay another $300. <laughs>
dollars each time. So you had mentioned running out of time as one of the concerns on the test using documentation. Is there a recommendation for like time per question or something you can give people so that they can self-pace? So that's really tough because each question is, has its own level of difficulty. And right now the number of questions on the exam may not be the same as later when there's evaluation. So I really can't tell you the number of questions that are on there. But you do have the ability to move back and forth between the questions. So if you're saying, man, you know what, I, I, I'm going to have trouble in this one. Let me just not waste time. Let me jump ahead and do another one and then come back to that one and catch it later on. You can do that. And I'd almost suggest you might do that if you've got some that you think it, it's going to stump you. Jump over, you know, put, open up a little. You, the way to take notes is you have to open up a little, like a text file in VI and you can take notes. Just open up a, a thing, take some notes, save that so you know how to come back. Don't get bogged down in a single question. Well, let me, on that note, um, so are you saying that there are no questions that are dependent on the previous question no, within the live no. system? There, there, each question is imp independent of the other one. So if okay. it, it, yeah, there's no dependency in between so questions. there's nothing that'll build upon that no. you right. would tear down later that would mess up the sequence. Right. Nope, nope, right. you're just fine there. They're all independent. Okay, thanks. But, um, I, I would like to advise you though, because of the weight, the neutron is pretty, uh, if you add up neutron and troubleshooting, that's like close to half the exam already. So if you yeah, could figure computer. those, two, plus compute. So yeah. you probably, if you're really good with compute, neutron, and, and um, uh, troubleshooting, I, I think you have a good chance of kind of surpassing. It's not so much a question as my friend out earlier today at the conference, but recently we put up a site called tristack.org which you can get some experience as a user for. So you're saying it's like a, a demo environment that you can practice in? Yeah, it's, so it's great. Mainly, That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. it's mainly Did, meant for, um, for like testing applications, but. But you could totally use yeah. it for practicing. TriStack, DevStack, uh, OpenStack Ansible, Mirantis, you say. Whatever. Whatever gives you the same API yeah. uh, and command line interactions with those APIs will, will be sufficient. Let's go over here. Hi. Hope I didn't miss this, um, this question before, but is there any passing grade or just pass fail kind of answer? Uh, so the exam is pass fail, but there, you don't have to have 100%. There is a percentage that you can get that's the threshold. Okay. I don't know what that is. Even okay. if I did, I'm not sure. Well, I, uh, I don't know what it is. <laughs> They're, they're still finalizing that, right? Everyone, this is, it's a new exam, testing, okay. not just you know, our ability to create questions, but how the exams work and so on. So that it, it's, they're still finalizing that. Um, and if you're taking the exam this week, that's why it may take a little bit longer for your results, but just something to keep in mind. All right, thanks. It looks like we've got five, five minutes left. Five minutes. Five minutes. Only Rons. We're only publishing Rons, actually. We did bring out one of the umbrellas that actually, we all out of, earlier, <laughs> just in case. All of our, <laughs> so all the names are listed on the item writing committee, so you could just ping and figure out, you could figure out who wrote which sections, actually. So Remember, we're, though, that those of us who do, th we do this, this is our job, and it's in our best interest to make sure this exam is as good as possible. Once we write the items and we pass it off to the guys who actually implement it, though, to be clear, they had to make some modifications to our items so that it could actually work in the environment. So there's this big old long chain of, you know, JTAC to item writing to implementation to evaluation that, you know, who, who do you shoot? <laughs> you know, if there's a problem. <laughs> oh, that's, this is not go there. <laughs> So, you know, one of the things, one of the reasons I wanted to be involved in this, and, and, and I think all of us did, is, you know, we're hiring OpenStack people on a regular basis. And having, having a baseline, whatever that is, people put OpenStack on a resume. If you, if you guys are out there recruiting, you've all seen this. You know, until you talk to a person, you don't have any sense of what, what they're doing. This will give us a way to apply a filter, apply a way to jumpstart people through a queue, and, and, and have that baseline for it. So, yeah, one okay, more question. Let me ask another, yeah. Um, for heat related questions, would you have uh, basic templates available in there or you need to memorize the uh, syntax part of the template? So you'll, not, you'll, you'll have to know how to create that template. So basic syntax, right? All right, with the, with the, uh, with the template version and everything. Okay, let me okay. be specific. They're not super complex. Right. Okay, if you can write a basic template 
understanding parameters, resources, those type of things, you're probably going to be okay. 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 All right. Yeah. Thanks. You don't have yep. to make like a bi big software config thing of, you know, All right. they're just basic. All right. All right. That Wait. works. Okay. Yeah, like, I guess maybe one last one here. Simple question. How long is the test? Two and a half hours. Okay. And is, is each question time nope. dependent? Nope. You can take all two you and could, a half hours for could, one question? You could. All right. And you'd fail. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Well, All right, I looks think like we're out of time. Yeah, Thanks. thank, thank you, very you very much. much. Appreciate it.